everyone! We're here today for another episode of Brain Cherries, a podcast where we discuss interesting topics and ideas around startups, innovation, art, and music. Together with my co-host Lucrezia, we have recorded a very special series of episodes for you, a two-part conversation with Adi Susin and Glenerick Cortez, founders of PyTech, a new business venture that is helping out in these unprecedented periods of crisis by commercializing high-quality certified masks and other equipment. So, without further ado, let's get right into the first part of the interview. So today we have the pleasure to talk with Adi, Susan and Glenn Eric Cortes. And in the past few weeks, these two guys created um, PyTech. It's a, basically a new business venture that is helping out during these unprecedented periods of crisis by commercializing high quality certified masks and also other equipment. So welcome both Adi and Glenn Eric, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for Thanks having, for having us. us. So how are you doing and where are you guys? We're both in sunny South Florida, oh, awesome. appreciating the fact that we're not stuck in Canada during the self-quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's super good, super good. So um, I want to start by asking you a little bit more about how you two met, how you decided to collaborate in this project, and also how the idea behind this business venture came to be. Maybe Addy can, can start? Yeah, sure. So. We met at an alumni, I, I, we went to the same business school, IE Business School, uh, based in Madrid, Spain. And we met at an alumni event that was actually in Miami about two years ago. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, what, is it, what was it, uh, tech singles or something event, but we were both taken, so we had like the, whatever we call it, up. <laughs> then maybe that, you shouldn't uh, have uh, been there. Identified. <laughs> no, it was like an IE Business School uh, plus tech school combined event yeah yeah they had this event where they wanted to have three companies sponsored at the same time so they told ie alumni that like anyone could come but the event was called technically single and promoting bumble just came out with a business app so if you okay when you, yeah when you came into the event if you were married you had to pick a blue cup and then if you were single you picked the bumble yellow cup and then if you were Com in a complicated relationship, you picked a green cup. Okay. And so we both had the blue cups. We were like, oh, perfect. Okay, yeah, let's talk about like serious things. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. It's basically yeah. one of those things where you go to every event that you organize just to like meet new people. And this is like one of those. Yeah. So yeah, great. So how, how did you decide then to work together after you've met uh, and after like a couple of years of, of maybe being friends and just keeping in touch? So we're both into water sports and we kind of clicked over that and the fact that we're both tech nerds, but in a little bit, we're, we're tech nerds, but not in the same bubble. So he's more on the data science side and I'm more on the growth hacking and uh, social media algorithm side. And um, he's more into the like big data and understanding everything at big picture at cor large corporations. And I work with really early stage startups. So we can connect and speak the same like tech nerd and water sport lingos, but we do have like our own separate fields where we're uh, more of a domain authority than the other. So I, I think like our knowledge in that um, complements each other well. And so over the past few years, every like month or so we'd get together and um, like with uh, my husband and daughter would come and we'd all do like a dinner or sometimes we did a barbecue and we would just throw out random ideas like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to do this or wouldn't it be cool to do that? And yeah, when um, so in earlier this year, I actually ended up with like having the whole health complication nightmare go down at the same time as a lot of other people in the country. And unfortunately, because I'm young, like I was not taken seriously. I was told to go home. My um, oxygen level dropped to 80%, which if it get, gets below that, you have uh, you can have brain damage, um, you can have a heart attack, you can have organ failure. And like my fingers, my hands and my arms turned blue and my fingers turned white from a lack of oxygen. So it was like a really bad experience. And I was documenting it on Instagram for friends wow. and family to see. But so you were at home when this happened? Yeah. You weren't hospitalized when you started having these 
conditions. No, even then they sent, they gave me an inhaler and sent me home. And I asked my, this was at the ER, and I asked my primary care doctor and he's like, you should have been hospitalized. Like there's no way they should have sent you home. But it was, when I got it, it was so early on that they didn't think young people could die from it. So they were like, no, you'll be fine. Everything says that like all of our research thus far says you'll be fine, go home. And my primary care doctor was like, they should have never let you leave the hospital premise with that. But Glenn Eric was like following up on everything. He's like the good older brother and checking in on me. And then when this opportunity came about, he was like, hey, based on what you went through, like we've been talking about having a business idea together for the past few years. You personally went through hell <laughs> earlier this year. Do you want to do something about it? Like what, what if we launch a startup that like to stop the spread. And I was like, yes, absolutely yes, sign me up. Like, So Glenn, Eric, yeah. it was an idea that, uh, like an opportunity that you had, and then uh, knowing what happened to Adi, then you decided to, you asked her to join in? Yeah, so we had already been talking about other business ideas before, so um, I wasn't really thinking of doing it on my own, because startups typically don't, don't work like that, uh, if you try to do something on your own. But, uh, so I, mentioned it to Adi to see if it was something that she would be interested in and uh, fortunately she was so had a co-founder for it and yeah so we started looking at different opportunities with masks either uh, disposable reusable um, what other products the uh, companies needed and Adi has a lot of connections in the startup space so there are some companies and, and she can talk a little bit more about that but that uh, told us uh, or her, what the what they needed, and uh, that kind of gave us more ideas too for products. How did you come up with the, the product range? So how did you decide what you wanted to, uh, to sell? Was it strictly related to the experience um, that Adi had or did you also see an opportunity for this type of products? So I work in consulting with startups. I help startups to grow. And I had the a few days before he had approached me, a few startups that are in the e-commerce space asked like, our business is tanking, our sales are tanking, what can we do to re, it, like, reinstill buyer confidence in our startup? And I was like, well, you know, not a lot of startups and e-commerce stores are advertising that they sterilize the product before they package it and ship it. So why don't we look at a sterilization solution for you? And at first it was just a, like a few e-commerce st startups. I didn't really think any, like, too much about it. And then when we launched the masks company, um, one of the startups I'm connected to was like, why can't I just buy the wand, like the UVC wand directly from you guys? Like if you're getting masks already, can't you get us wands? And if you're getting us wands, can't you get us ozone lamps for our offices? <laughs> and while you're at it, could you get something to sterilize our cars for if we're driving clients around? <laughs> wow, so it's actually, it's it was the clients who, or potential clients that gave you the idea of what you could sell through the company and through the website, right? Yeah, it, and that's a lot of the startups I work with, that's actually how it happens is like I'll have a few people that I know are interested buyers in an area and I'll say, oh, this startup is thinking of launching this. They're like, great, so I want this, 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 this. Can that startup give it to me? I'm like, well, let me talk to the founder. So we literally just applied the same thing here. It's what did people need? What do they want to buy? And how can we get it to them? Wow. So how, how does the production and like sourcing uh, works like do you buy all the equipment first and then you resell it or how does it work? Um, the business school we went to has students coming in from 72 countries around the world So if we don't have a supplier who can get us something we most likely know between the two of us We know someone who knows a supplier or is a supplier owns their own manufacturing facilities So getting the product isn't such an issue um, It's more of seeing what people want so for example, with the masks, we weren't sure at first if the silicone, um, the pie seal and the pie shield would actually work with people. So what we did is our first website, we had the N95 mask up next to the pie seal, next to the pie shield. And I just told people, hey, um, you were asking about reusable masks and N95s. We have some up if you want to go check out the website. And everyone went and bought the pie seal. 
We were like, okay, well, that tells us what we should now go order. So we, we did the research first to pick out what we thought was best. We looked for FDA and FCC approved manufacturers to make sure that the products are like safe for American consumers. And then we brought mm -hmm. that, we brought in three options and kind of just let them pick. Okay, so you, you hadn't bought the pieces yet when you put them um, on the website. It was just to try, like you knew you could get them, but at that point yeah. you didn't own them. It was just to see which one was the one that clients uh, would prefer. Yeah, and then as soon as we had a few orders, we immediately brought like more than enough inventory in. But, yeah, at that point we had um, vetted the suppliers and yeah. had co uh, constant communication with them, but we hadn't actually uh, bought the product. So then we can see which product we should actually buy, how much, and things like that beforehand. To have a little bit of traction, because imagine if you launch something and there are no sales, so you, end, you could end up with a lot of inventory. Yeah, no, exactly. But I guess in order to do that, then you also have to have established trust with these suppliers, because you're telling yeah. them, and I expect you to sell me this much, but maybe it would be you know, another product or another one. So I guess, there's also some trust involved between you and these people that you were talking to, the potential suppliers. We, we did stay up until, uh, I think, 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. every night that week, um, <laughs> negotiating with suppliers. <laughs> we <barely> tied it. <laughs> negotiating with suppliers like in different time zones to make sure that what we wanted was possible and that we could get it here. And then, because um, there were a few masks that I thought would be really cool to bring here, but the, the facilities were not FCC approved. They were not FDA approved. The, they wanted us to order like 30,000. And so we, it did, it wasn't like a two second thing. It did take a solid week of staying up till very late hours, waking up very early to like work on our own full-time jobs and work on this. But yeah, I mean, it worked out in the end. Actually, I'm a bit curious given you mentioned that you met uh, at IE, uh, but it, it seems that both of you already had experience before. Can you give us maybe a little bit of an introduction on what you were doing before that university and, you know, where you got your experience from? So, of course, you have very different areas of uh, focus. So I think our listeners would be very interested in understanding how you got there and, you know, what type of skills you have acquired along the way that are helping you build this company now. Yeah, I think Glenn, Eric should go first. Sure. I worked at Procter & Gamble for about 10 years um, and they they make, um, for those who don't know the company, they make a, a back when I was working there they had about 300 brands. I think they got rid of uh, some of them uh, to kind of focus the, the company, but they make Charmin, Bounty, Gillette, uh, Dawn, Tide, um, just, just about uh, all, all kinds of consumer and household goods. And uh, there I was in, I, I, I kind of, uh, over 10 years of course, I had a lot of different experiences all within data and analytics, but sometimes it would be more manufacturing or dealing with uh, FDA or um, uh, more like uh, forecasting market sizes. So uh, after, after that, I decided to move to Miami and also in analytics, um, worked in HBO and um, also in an ad agency, which was very interesting. It was more startup-like than, than a big company like Procter & Gamble. And now mm -hmm. um, I work at Royal Caribbean uh, doing machine learning. And so that's my day job doing, uh, at Royal Caribbean. And then in my spare time, um, I'm doing uh, this startup. So what about you, um, Ad, instead? Because we, we had a look at your, like what you were doing before, and you mentioned also um, that you already had been working with startups and strategies to let them um, grow faster, grow better. Um, both my parents are small business owners slash serial entrepreneurs, and I grew up like in their startup space uh, with their small businesses. Pretty much, like that was what we did on weekends. We were with my parents, like in the office, while most kids were like running around the mall. It's like, wait, you go to the mall? What? <laughs> um, 
So I've been working with non-family owned startups since 2009. At this point, the fastest I've grown a startup is to 100, from idea on paper, to more than 108 million in sales in less than five years. And um, that's really just what my strong suit is, figuring out how to get somebody's startup to uh, grow, either by sales or revenue, as fast as possible. And so building out systems to scale based on their current resources and current goals, and then constantly upgrading. Like, oh great, now you have three employees instead of yourself. Let's add this in and now you have 15 employees let's add this in but yeah so growing startups is really the only thing i'm good at well well it's not a small thing to be good at i mean it's, it's a <laughs> quite amazing childhood Yeah, that's really interesting. So having so much experience with startups and also now having like a new one that you're nurturing these days, um, do you see any common traits that make startups either grow and grow to success or fail? Yeah, and so in the US, 90% of startups that launch actually fail. They, they're dead within um, three to five years. And it's really... I mean, it's really easy to see that happen on a regular basis simply because there are 100 small things you could do wrong within your first three weeks. And there are 1,000 like, tiny things that you could do wrong within your first two months. And if you don't know what those tiny things are to look for, like you're dead before you even had a chance to lock in your first few sales. Our model, what we did, where we had people that are, were interested before we even set up the solution, allowed us to have sales. We literally had the idea, like agreed on it, and we had our first sales coming in by Friday. And Glenaric came up with the idea on Sunday. So that was not even, what, six days to our first sale. Most startups, they're sitting behind the scenes, they're working, 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 working on something, not showing it to anybody, not talking with anyone about it. And then when they bring it to light, like they have the whole battle of the customer acquisition um, growth I guess, journey. Um, something that we use, uh, I think, I, I try to use with as many startups I work with as possible is a beta launch concept. So you have people that are excited and are helping you to design and um, create your product offering or your service from the beginning. And that allows you to, when you do it like in that sort of way where you're creating a solution for people in real time, you have customers from the beginning. So you solve the cash flow problem very early on. Um, I think something else that a lot of people make a mistake with is they don't have a strong brand identity. And when you have a strong brand identity, you can be memorable to the consumer from day one. And if you don't have that, then people are like, oh yeah, my friend's daughter's startup. I don't remember what it is. But if you like pick a color palette, pick an archetype, pick a logo and just commit to it, like, and just stick with it, put it on everything so that is by your third week, every, like people who have interacted with you since week one, they know your brand. They've, it's seared into their memory. Um, those are just a few of the small things that I think made a huge difference in our success so far. you uh, find your target market so how, how did you understand what where your potential consumers were uh, how did you go find them maybe tell us a little bit more about your customer acquisition strategy I guess this is something that a lot of startups also kind of fail to realize um, if they're in the on the trajectory for death is your first customers are people who already know you and trust you and they're people who are excited about buying something specifically from you And so we really just, our target market was, okay, who's in our scope of influence or in our inner circles that wants to buy this specifically from us? And what is the best way to make that solution appealing to them? And that's kind of how we figured out who we would be targeting. And then of the people who were like, oh, I'd love this solution or, oh, I'd love for um, to have this. We looked at, okay, well, people are saying, yeah, they'd love to have this, but they actually buy it. 
So that's why we had the three masks up before we purchased a mask. We wanted to see, okay, they said that this is what they're looking for, but is that really what they mean? And when we put it out and they purchased it, then it was like, okay, we have a validation. You have listened to the first of a two-part interview with Adi and Glenn Rick, co-founders of PyTech. In the next episode, we're going to talk about how to scale a small business, make your startup recession-proof, and work well with co-founders and stakeholders, even without seeing each other. I'll see you next week for another exciting episode of Brain Cherries. Bye-bye!